Uh, I'm Ernie Moniz, uh, C uh, CEO of the Energy Futures Initiative, and uh, I had the pleasure of serving uh, President Obama as the 13th uh, Energy Secretary. And uh, in that role, uh, as Dan already said, I had the enormous pleasure uh, of working very, very closely with the 68th Secretary of State, my great friend, uh, John Kerry. Uh, in fact, as uh, Dan mentioned, uh, in 2015, uh, we lived together quite a bit, uh, both uh, on the road to Paris uh, and on the uh, negotiation of the Iran deal. And this is a case where I'm very pleased to say uh, familiarity bred friendship uh, and uh, and I think one that will uh, uh, continue to serve as well uh, as John uh, serves uh, President Biden and maybe I can help kibitz from the outside uh, with the great team that the president has put together. Uh, uh, John and I are also fellow uh, Boston College Eagles, so uh, fellow Bostonians. We have lots and lots of uh, of, of associations. And uh, uh, again, I, I welcome him and I welcome all of you for what I think is a very important conversation uh, as uh, John can elaborate uh, on the president's and his plans uh, as special envoy, uh, uh, special presidential envoy for, for climate. And in fact, John, again, a welcome. Uh, great to see you. And uh, let's just jump right into it with um, uh, telling us about uh, the president's and your plans for the international uh, climate scene uh, in 2021. Well, thank you, Ernie. Uh, it's great to be with you, and I'm delighted to appear uh, during this week, important gathering of uh, folks uh, in the energy field and every aspect of the energy sector. And I might just add, it, it bred not only friendship, uh, Ernie, but it bred respect because your knowledge uh, was essential, both in helping us with the Iran nuclear agreement as well as Paris. Uh, President Biden has set out uh, the most ambitious uh, climate agenda, uh, not as a matter of ideology, not as a matter of politics, but exclusively as a matter of listening to the scientists and watching and evaluating the evidence. And the fact is that from joining the Paris, rejoining the Paris Agreement within hours of being sworn in to pulling together a climate team that I certainly have great respect for and am proud to be part of, uh, this is very, very high on our agenda. The climate crisis, and it is a crisis, and I think the International Energy Agency will be releasing data today that will document this uh, even further, uh, is uh, a national security threat. It's a health threat. It's an economic threat. We've spent billions upon billions of dollars just cleaning up after now much more intensive hurricanes, storms, floods, fires. Uh, and and the, you know, science is completely unified uh, around the reality of what is happening to the planet and what will continue to happen with great threats to human beings in terms of conflict potential, massive numbers of refugees. We already have climate refugees. We're seeing dislocation with respect to crops, uh, growing farmers around the world, uh, food disruption, uh, and, and our own military. The Pentagon has long said that the climate crisis is in fact a threat multiplier. And the military is making uh, all kinds of contingency plans accordingly. So we're, our plan is to, the president's plan, is to have the United States step back in and help lead a sensible, thoughtful approach that is based on the science and based on good economics and, and seizing the prospects of the future, which is filled with opportunity for new jobs, for extraordinary growth in our economy, uh, but to do so, building back better from COVID-19 uh, and investing in the energy transition that is the, uh, just an enormous marketplace of the future. Some $500 billion was invested in, uh, in uh, transportation, in new energy power, uh, in, in reduction of emissions over the course of the last year alone. And the prospects are that there will be about 10 trillion invested over the next 30 years as we move to the mid-century measurement of net zero. So our goal is to, in Glasgow, in about eight months, 
We will meet with the nations that met in Paris to hold the Earth's temperature, hopefully, to no larger than a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase. And our hope is that by keeping 1.5 degrees alive in the next 10 years, we lay the groundwork for the exciting venture of transitioning to clean energy, new energy, hydrogen, whatever it's going to be. Uh, and, in, and, and hopefully so many of the folks joining us today will be part of this important transition. Great, John, and you, you mentioned the, uh, the, the importance of the president's uh, rejoining Paris uh, so soon after inauguration. But I would also add, uh, it was a big signal when he appointed you uh, so soon after the election. And, uh, and in fact, uh, uh, that also raised the national security implications you, you mentioned uh, by uh, also giving you that seat on the National Security Council uh, and cabinet rank. So uh, the, these signals are really important. Uh, but if I go back to Paris and uh, the road to Paris, um, uh, I think one can argue that um, uh, in late 2014, when uh, President Obama and President Xi uh, appeared together and, and talked about uh, the road to Paris together, uh, that may have been really the key turning point uh, for the, the nations of the world coming together um, and, and accepting responsibility. I'm assuming that that work with China, with you today, is going to be critical. But of course, the geopolitical situation with China is so much more complicated uh, and tense. Can you just say a little bit about how you see that, uh, that, that going forward? Well, Bernie, it's a great question, and it's obviously a, a, a compelling moment with respect to the relationship with China. Um, yes, there are tensions today that did not exist back then, or they existed, but they were a little more sub rosa. Now uh, they're out in the open, and it is no secret that there is strong competition with China with respect to any number of fields, and there ought to be. That's not a problem. I think the United States, people don't believe us when we say that, President Obama used to say it, we welcome the competition. The United States does well with competition and we're not afraid of it. What we don't want is an unfair playing field. What we don't want is um, our companies having their intellectual property stolen or, or, or you know, exacted from them as a price for being able to do business and so forth. These things are obviously significant issues, and they will exist. But climate, the climate crisis, is not something that can fall victim to those other concerns and contests. Because China is 30% of all the world's emissions, it is the number one emitter in the world. We are the number two emitter in the world. Uh, and when you add Europe, the EU as an entity, uh, you're well over 55% of all the emissions of the world with three entities. So there's no solving this by any one country alone. You have to have China at the table. And just as Ronald Reagan was able to go to Reykjavik and negotiate with Mikhail Gorbachev and turn around uh, uh, 50,000 warheads pointed at each other uh, and reduce them to some 1,500 plus today, so we can deal with this as a compartmentalized issue that, you know, there'll be no other choices if we don't deal with this one correctly. So I believe um, the, the, the relationship that we built with China, I remember going there and meeting with President Xi, negotiating uh, a change in the Chinese approach, because until we negotiated in 2015, China had been uh, leading the G77 and in opposition to most of what we were trying to do. So that has changed. And we will engage with China. We will be uh, pursuing a, a, a track on climate that does not get confused by the other items. And um, we've made it very, very clear that, that that's the way we have to proceed. Now, I think China uh, can be a critical partner in this as they were before. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, India also and other countries. Uh, Russia is 7% of emissions. Uh, Japan is uh, about 5%. We, we have to get the major emitting nations back together. And to that end, uh, President Biden has instructed uh, me and our team to pull together a summit 
in April, April 22nd, of all of the major emitting nations of the world. We're already talking to them about this. They will be there virtually, and we will specifically be asking all of those major emitter nations to raise their ambition as we go to Glasgow. We are way behind, Ernie, and you know this. Even if we did everything that every country set out to do in the Paris Agreement, and we're not, but even if we did, the Earth's temperature is predicted to rise to something like 3.7 degrees Celsius. That's obviously catastrophic. That is why the raising ambition as we go to, to uh, Glasgow is so critical. And we are working now on designing our national defined contribution, NDC. Uh, we are going to hopefully announce our NDC at this summit in April. Uh, it will have to be aggressive because we're behind. And, and I think it will become more apparent to countries and corporations around the world how far behind we are in the course of these next weeks. So this issue of raising ambition and getting more done, of holding alive the, the 1.5 degree limit, and of setting the pathway clearly defined with real roadmaps for how we get to net zero by 2050, that's the key. And that's exactly what we're gonna be focused on with China and with a lot of other countries. Now, John, you, you can make some real news by telling us what you think the NDC will be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, aggressive, it, it's gotta be achievable. It also has to be real, Ernie. Right. Uh, and we know that. Uh, it's got to be real, achievable. Look, exciting things are happening. I mean, I think people need to be more upbeat about the possibilities here. We are staring at the opportunity to have the greatest economic transformation, uh, certainly, I mean, since the Industrial Revolution, uh, certainly since the uh, communications and technology burst of the 1990s. But this is the biggest market the world has ever known. It's a, it's a you know, five billion user market today. It's gonna to go up to nine billion users over the course of the next 30 years. Uh, as we you know, grow with the population of the planet, there are a billion people who have no electricity today. They need it, they want it. So this effort to transition to clean vehicles, it's happening. Ford Motor Company put 22 billion into new vehicles, into, uh, into EVs. You have uh, uh, GM, which is announced by 2035, it's only gonna produce electric cars. You got Tesla, the highest valued capitalized corporation in the world, uh, in, in automotive industry, uh, producing only electric vehicles. So that's going to happen. The effort to transition uh, into clean power production is absolutely going to happen. Already it is cheaper to produce with uh, both wind and solar uh, as opposed to uh, many fossil fuels, most, certainly coal. And, and the result is that that transition is already being made by the marketplace, not government ordered, not regulated, but the marketplace is making the decision for people. And I think if you look at what is gonna happen in terms of investment, the Labor Bureau of Labor Statistics says that the, the only three places where they predict more than 50% job growth in the next year, is no, and there are 3.6 million jobs now in, in, in that area, which is uh, um, in uh, uh, retail, and then you have about double that number of jobs being predicted for and, and, and being held by uh, hotels and triple that amount of jobs of currently working folks in, ga in oil and gas. So there's just a clear direction that the marketplace is moving already. And, and uh, we think in the administration that if we build back smart, build back better, put the right incentives in place and work with the industry. And, and we invite the industry. I mean, there are huge opportunities here. You know this better than anybody, Ernie, that oil and gas has incredible infrastructure, incredible capacity to move energy from one place to another. What if that happened for hydrogen? There's a future in, in, in I think, this new partnership as we design the energy modalities of the future 
And uh, I think it's a very, very exciting transition that we're looking at. Uh, John, that's great. Uh, but it, let, let me just pull the thread a little bit more on the Chinese uh, compartment, compartmenting of the climate and, and other issues uh, in the sense that um, we are seeing, uh, frankly, increasing tension on, on supply chain questions, uh, you know, China supplying most of the rare earth minerals that are so critical for uh, clean technologies. Uh, and so the question is, do you really see being able to untangle that kind of competition from climate cooperation? I think you can untangle, disentangle some of it, Ernie, uh, perhaps not all of it. Uh, but the fact is that uh, India, for instance, is extremely focused on the idea of creating its own solar capacity. You know full well there are advances being made in uh, solar panels that create panels that are 40% more efficient and don't rely on the same uh, ingredients as the panels being produced by China in a market they have cornered at this moment. So there are future possibilities here of new supply chains, of new powerhouse production entities. Uh, as the technology advances, which it will, technology always does. And so I think we're gonna see a very different uh, field of competition, number one. Number two, uh, I think China, in the conversations that I had when I was secretary and even more recently uh, in these last couple of years at various conferences, expresses a willingness and desire to work with other countries with respect to some of those. And I think you have to put that to the test. I don't think we have yet. The one belt, one road is a challenge with respect to uh, their funding of uh, coal in various parts of the world. About 70% of the new coal-fired power coming online in various parts of the world is Chinese funded. And we've raised that issue with them and that will continue to be uh, a bone of contention. Uh, but I do think, uh, for instance, on hydrogen, uh, that's, any, that's jump ball right now. Uh, we need to get much more involved in the development of that. I know India, I've talked to industrialists in India and government uh, leaders who are focused on the potential of creating India the, the hydrogen economy as a future. And so I think, um, you know, if, if we can make that happen in a way that is not as energy intensive as it is today, not as, as, as fossil fuel intensive as it is today, or as CO2 intensive, I should say, because if you have, I mean, as unabated uh, carbon uh, intensive, that's the key here. Uh, and I think that the fossil fuel industry clearly could do a lot more to transition into being a full-fledged energy company that is embracing some of these new technologies. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not that people, I don't object per se to, uh, the, to fossil fuel. I object to the byproduct of fossil fuel, which is the carbon. That's the problem. And the methane. That's another major problem emerging. So we have to be able to abate. Uh, it's the debate between unabated and abated production. In addition, I think we have to pursue every other form of energy as a hedge against whatever technology can or can't produce. Obviously, if we have a breakthrough on storage, uh, that is gonna be a game changer and people are chasing that grail. In addition, um, uh, if we can uh, find a, a breakthrough on the next generation of nuclear, uh, some people may be shocked to hear me say that, but I think fourth generation, modular, some variation thereon. Bill Gates is pursuing that now assiduously. Uh, I think we need to see how that comes out in the event that something else doesn't produce. Um, and as Bill Gates has said, you know, one of three miracles, either the miracle of storage, the miracle of fusion, or the miracle of fission. Some people object to that, but I, I believe we need an all of the above approach uh, because it's urgent uh, that we reduce the emissions at a much faster rate than we are today. Uh, John, I can only say that uh, your allusion to carbon capture, the abatement issue, uh, carbon dioxide removal, hydrogen, advanced nuclear, uh, I can only say that <laughs> for whatever it's worth, I am completely aligned with you. We need to provide as many options to everyone to go to low carbon as, as we can. 
But, you know, you've also raised now a couple of times India. Uh, and, um, of course, uh, India and China uh, also have some tensions, shall we say. So, but, and, and India has, a, has continues, of course, of course, to grow enormously even since Paris. So uh, any comments on that kind of triangular relationship, yes. uh, U.S., China, and, and India? Well, as you know, Ernie, you worked very hard with us in the development of mission innovation. And um, mission innovation needs to come back in full force. Uh, there are folks working on that. We're going to try and see if we can't push the innovation curve with India. India has a plan to produce about 450 gigawatts of uh, renewable power by 2030. It's a very ambitious goal. It's a great goal. But they need about $600 billion in order to be able to help make that kind of a transition. Their finance is perhaps one of the biggest challenges with respect to India. But they are determined uh, to lead and to be an important player here. And, and, and we think that's very, very significant. We want to work with them. I've put together a small consortia of a number of countries that are prepared to help India with some of the finance and transition. I've been working with major uh, investment houses and asset managers in our country uh, to try to determine how much private sector capital can be directed in, 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 in uh, the right place here so that we can make this transition faster. Uh, many, many companies, as you know, are dealing with ESG uh, as well as SDG commitments. And in addition, now finding that it's very attractive to focus on a directly climate-related uh, type of investment. I know Hank Paulson is uh, working on the development of a new SPAC uh, that uh, will be focused on some of this. <clears throat> There's been enormous growth in investment, uh, in, in longer-term longer speculation uh, investment. And I think uh, it's clear why. Predictions are that by 2050, you're going to have about $6 trillion a year of economic transfer taking place in the clean energy uh, technology sector. Uh, and, and, and it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's the market of the future. You're already seeing massive allocation. Last year, that $500 billion that was allocated to wind, solar, uh, power, uh, transportation, clean transportation, electric vehicles, is enormous, and, and, and there's no sign that that is going to suddenly be reduced. Most people are predicting it'll be significantly more this year. So uh, the marketplace is making a, a critical decision here, um, and uh, I think this is going to race ahead, personally. That's, my ju that's just a personal feeling about it. Watched it over the years. This is an unprecedented level of interest and an unprecedented level of capacity that's been developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, mission innovation. Uh, the uh, I think the major step forward taken on the first day of COP twenty one. Uh, and uh, do you you see? Well, okay, I've seen. I feel that even in these last uh, four years, we have seen in Congress quite a bit of bipartisanship on the innovation agenda. How do you see that going forward? Do you think the United States going back into Paris is going to really elevate mission innovation and? maybe establish some new directions? How do you see that playing out? Well, I do, Ernie. I, I think it, it should, put it that way. Uh, Congress, <laughs> I spent 26 years in the Senate, is more unpredictable today than at any time historically. And obviously the partisanship is a problem when it comes to asserting America's best interests because we're just not doing it in many ways. We need a major infrastructure investment in the United States of America. We need Texas is a prime example of what we need to build out, which is a capacity to transmit energy all around our country. We have an East Coast grid. We have a West Coast grid. Uh, we have this singular Texas grid. And then we have a line that goes across the north of our country from Chicago into the Dakotas, et cetera. We have a gaping hole in the middle of our country. And you can't send energy from one place to another. You bear the scars, Ernie, of, of trying to get transmission that would bring uh, electrons from the western part of our country to the east. And you ran into the politics that resisted that. We can't afford that anymore. We need to have a smart grid. We need, in this age of artificial intelligence and computer, quantum computing, to be able to use that 
facility to be able to send energy and to predict ahead of time what's going to happen and to create literally a smart grid. So that will save us huge amounts of money. It'll actually uh, reduce emissions and, and produce a capacity to have the baseload uh, challenges met without necessarily having yet developed all the storage. So you could get to maybe 80 or 90 percent of uh, uh, a virtuous cycle with uh, renewables and, and uh, a better mix. We're working with Canada now to see what we can do to perhaps uh, augment the amount of energy coming from Canada that is clean and help us produce. But we're going to have to get rid of some of our chauvinism and our, our parochial components that resist common sense and the need to move very, very hastily to get this done. Yeah, you certainly uh, remind me of the, the scars that you referred to uh, in terms of also facing, uh, in some sense, the conflict between uh, federal and state prerogatives. Uh, and I'll just mention, John, that uh, I have had a chance to talk with uh, Jennifer Granholm, now confirmed as uh, the 16th Secretary of Energy, and uh, we've talked about the opportunity to, for, her, for her to uh, acquire some of these scars as well uh, as a major focus of her, of her activity. Yeah. John, you know, you mentioned something very important uh, I'd like to go back to. Uh, you mentioned how the oil and gas companies in particular uh, uh, can become uh, part of the, your, let's call it your allies uh, in, in, this, in this climate adventure. I think uh, today the large utilities uh, in the United States have certainly been in the lead in decarbonization. Uh, uh, can you be a little bit more specific in terms of what you see the oil and gas companies uh, uh, doing to become energy companies? And in fact, just this morning, in looking at the newspaper, I saw that uh, the American Petroleum Institute is talking about supporting a uh, climate, uh, a carbon, a carbon charge. So things are. Well, I'm happening. reminded. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm reminded of uh, I'm reminded of the Saudi oil minister in the 1970s when I was going to law school and sitting in a in a in a traffic jam for hours just to get gas as we were lined up during the crisis doing my contracts and my criminal law, sitting there in a car advancing five feet every three minutes. Uh, the oil minister said that uh, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones, and the oil age is not going to end because we run out of oil. And I think we need to take that uh, to heart here. Uh, the market is changing. Uh, people want electric vehicles. People are beginning, you know, they're buying differently I, 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 and, and they're looking for solutions and the people are demanding this. One of the reasons China joined us a number of years ago uh, was not just what I hope was some power of persuasion, but they joined us because their citizens were rebelling against the quality of their air, the quality of their water. And in China, there was a political rationale for them uh, uh, moving. And, and so here we are now. Um, if you're a chieftain of an energy, of, a, of, a, of an oil and gas company, you can't help, I would think, but read the tea leaves of the spreadsheets of what's coming in front of you as you look at where the market is going. And you already see that uh, uh, people are going to be buying less gas in the future. They're going to be moving to electric vehicles. President Biden is going to be building out 500,000 charging stations across the country. He's going to be rolling out, hopefully fast, the transformation of 500,000 school buses to electric buses. So, the, you know, this question of producing clean power is going to grow as there's more demand for that energy. But also, um, it's going to be clear that there are going to be less users, less people coming into a gas station. Uh, and, and that will accelerate, I believe, with time. So where's the revenue going to come from? If you're sitting there in an oil and gas company, you don't want to be sitting there with a lot of stranded assets. And some people are obviously fighting to hold off that inevitability. But that fight is, I think, is, is uh, useless. And you're going to wind up on the wrong side of this battle. What they ought to be doing is be figuring out how do we become not an oil and gas company, but how do we become an energy company? How do we produce and how do we reduce the byproduct of oil and gas, which is carbon, which is the problem, and the methane, which is the problem. 
So that's the challenge. There are some companies, I'm not going to get into naming individual companies, but there are some companies you're all familiar with, which are moving more aggressively to make their transition. And there are others which continue to fight to hold on to whatever the market share is, which is going to diminish. So, I mean, I think you're going to have long haul hydrogen trucks, whether it is, you know, Tesla or Daimler or Nikola or whoever it's going to be. I don't know, but it's going to happen. And Europe is moving more rapidly to smaller, but nevertheless, uh, hydrogen vehicles. You have hydrogen cars. The test is going to be how do we produce the hydrogen in a way that isn't <laughs> damaging and, and, and so energy intensive. We'll get there. We're going to do that. I have no doubt about it. So if you're, if you're involved uh, as an energy, as a, as a oil and gas company today, you've got this incredible infrastructure. You have the ability to move and transport hydrogen. There are all kinds of ways to transition and to accelerate this, this transition, which we need to do. So I, I just, um, you know, I, I think it's fairly obvious, Ernie. I don't think there's any rocket science in it, but yes, there still is resistance to this transformation. And, and that's something we really can't afford very much anymore. Well, thanks, John. I think this has been very, very illuminating uh, for everyone to understand uh, how you're approaching uh, this, this year and the president is approaching this year. Uh, you got uh, a big job to do, an important job to do, and it's in good hands. Uh, and so thanks uh, for, sh for sharing this time with us here and with the Survey Week uh, uh, audience. And uh, thanks for all of you for uh, listening in. Oh, thanks for your leadership, too, Ernie. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, John.